Today we're summarizing a great piece of evidence for the Creator God of the Bible. Yes, it's the amazing complexity of the human genome. Today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Thomas Bailey. All right, today we'll be looking at discoveries in genetics that powerfully support that DNA was created and that it could never be the result of millions of years of evolution. We're also going to explore problems with evolutionary assumptions about DNA, the failed predictions and scientific dead ends that often result when you approach observations with the wrong assumptions. Yeah, and along the way, we'll, we'll reveal some of the mind-bogglingly complex yeah. biological machinery associated with DNA. This will be fun. DNA, by the way, is an instruction code for how to build and operate a living thing. All living things have DNA. Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft, made this statement back in 1995. He wrote, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. He wasn't kidding. An organism's genetic material is called a genome. Since Gates made that statement, we have learned that the human genome is way more complex than he or anyone else knew at that time. Yeah, meanwhile, evolutionists continue to maintain that all living creatures, including their DNA, obviously, mm -hmm. evolved by random processes, natural processes only over millions of years. No intelligent designer. Mm -hmm. That's their assumption. Yeah. Our assumption as Bible believers includes what King David wrote, for example, 3,000 years ago. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Let's crank the clock back to 1859, long before Bill Gates, when Charles Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species. Now, the thinking back then was that the cell was a fairly simple blob of matter. It's easier to imagine organisms evolving slowly and gradually if they're fairly simple. Right. We now know that there are problems with that view. <laughs> Darwin didn't know anything about genetics, which really took off shortly after he published. He did, however, famously admit, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now, while Darwin was referring to organs, yeah. We can apply this logic at the molecular level since, as we mentioned, evolutionists now assert that even DNA formed as a result of random natural processes. For example, biochemist Michael Behe coined the term irreducible complexity. Now that refers to a system of interacting parts in which every part has to be in place before it can function. Now this means that a system couldn't come into being gradually bit by bit, and there are many examples of this kind of evolution-refuting design in molecular biology. Here's an example. Life depends on an incredible enzyme called ATP synthase. That's the name of the world's tiniest rotary motor, rotating at up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimeter. Yeah, ATP synthase makes ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, the fuel that powers cellular machines. Each of the human body is about 14 trillion cells perform this reaction about a million times a minute. Wow. <laughs> Over half of your body's weight of ATP is made and consumed every day. A current of protons yeah. drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors, which use electrons. The portion shown here in green is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP, which is then released, making way for the next cycle. This nanomachine exhibits all the characteristics of super intelligent design. That's right. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. That's an evolutionary impossibility. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Getting back to DNA. In 1962, James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for their discovery of the structure of DNA. That was in 1953. DNA, by the way, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. 
Now say that 10 times fast. <laughs> or once for that matter. <laughs> DNA is the most compact information storage system in the universe. The amount of information that could be stored in just a pinhead's volume of DNA is equivalent to a pile of paperback books 500 times as high as the distance from Earth to the moon, each with a different yet specific content. <laughs> a single gram of DNA could store about 215 petabytes, or if in, in the UK, petabytes. That's 1.21 gigawatts, or, or no, <laughs> it's 215 million gigabytes. Either way, that's a lot. That's a lot. All, all of that information is stored in a double helix molecule made up of four chemical letters, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, or A, C, G, and T. It's already a huge problem for evolutionists to explain how these chemical letters could arise spontaneously from right. a so-called primordial soup of non-living chemicals. But it gets better. It, it, better, better for us, right. worse for the evolutionists. In the protein coding areas of the genome, these four letters are arranged in three letter combinations called codons, sort of like words in a human language. Now, consider that if you change one letter in a word, you either get gibberish, you get nothing, mm -hmm. or you could get a different meaning, like changing, for example, C-A-T to C-A-R in English. That's a different meaning. Right. But the letters themselves don't mean anything unless they're translated. For example, in English, the letters G-I-F-T mean a present. That's something nice. Right. But that same sequence of letters in German, which is my first language, means poison. Ouch. <laughs> Not something you want to find under the Christmas tree. No. Now, each three-letter codon codes for one protein letter called an amino acid. And there are a total of 64 possible codons, but there are only 21 different amino acids coding for proteins. Well, this means that more than one codon can be used for any particular amino acid. Yeah, but why so much duplication? As, as cells divide and DNA gets copied, copying errors or mutations occur. Sometimes letters get put in the wrong place, but this apparent duplication means that in many cases, one letter can get changed and still result in the production of the correct amino acid. And that is brilliant engineering by the creator god of the Bible. <laughs> Not only that, even if an error results in the wrong amino acid being selected, it will often have characteristics similar to the correct one. Yeah, amazing. Well, this is just one of the design features in DNA, and we'll talk about more of them after the break. Many people think that the biblical flood of Noah was abandoned because of the evidence. However, history tells a different story. Modern geological thought owes much to a man named Charles Lyell. Lyell, a lawyer, published a book in 1830 called Principles of Geology. Described as a masterpiece of persuasion, it changed the way people thought about Earth's past. According to Lyell, we should only appeal to today's geological processes to explain Earth history. However, this approach meant that the global flood recorded in the Bible was automatically ruled out of consideration. Lyell wanted, he wrote, to free the science of geology from Moses. Regrettably, many people have uncritically adopted Lyell's philosophy without considering how Noah's flood can help us understand Earth history. Lyell changed the way many people think, but his approach was motivated by his anti-biblical philosophy. Indeed, it is very difficult to explain Earth's history without Noah's flood. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. This is fun, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about more design features surrounding DNA. Now, these are things that are very difficult for evolution to explain. You may have heard about the infamous Miller-Urey experiment back in 1953, in which electricity was added to certain gases under specialized conditions. This was intended to show how life could spontaneously arise without God. Right. But the experiment actually showed that it took a great deal of intelligence to set up conditions that produce mostly a lot of tar and just a few amino acids. Yeah. This is a long way from a living cell. Yeah, here are some of the problems with that experiment. First, there were starting assumptions about what gases would have been present on the primordial Earth, and these didn't include oxygen, which tends to destroy chemical bonds, preventing anything from forming. Now, since then, evidence indicates that oxygen likely was present at the time. Oops. So because it didn't accurately simulate the Earth's atmosphere, it's, it's pretty much irrelevant as an experiment, and those amino acids could not have formed. Not only that, many molecules required for life exist in two forms that look like mirror images of each other, like your left and right hands. This is called chirality, from the Greek word for hand. 
The Miller-Urey experiment produced equal amounts of left and right-handed forms of amino acids. Yeah, but all amino acids and proteins are left-handed, while all sugars in DNA and RNA and in metabolic pathways are right-handed. Random chemical reactions won't produce 100% left-handed right. amino acids that are needed for life. This is just one example of thousands where evolutionists have major problems explaining how life originated. Yeah. But evolution continues to be promoted as established scientific fact. It's not. No. <laughs> let's, let's move on to another evolutionary problem. Discoveries in genetics refutes the idea of ape-to-human evolution. The neo-Darwinian theory of evolution says that all life on Earth arose from a common ancestor by way of random mutations to genes preserved by natural selection. Organisms with beneficial mutations produced more offspring than those with deleterious or damaging mutations. Some beneficial mutations provided adaptations to new or changed environments, producing new kinds of organisms. In order to get extra new information to build more complex organisms, existing genes must have been duplicated and then mutated into something useful. Right, but population geneticist J.B.S. Haldane realized that when a beneficial mutation occurs in a population, the number of copies of that mutation must increase over time for the population to progress evolutionarily. It has to substitute for the non-mutated genes in the population. But the rate at which this can happen is limited. Haldane realized that there hasn't been enough time to accumulate enough beneficial mutations to transform an ape-like creature into a human. This became known as Haldane's Dilemma, and yeah. he explained it like this. Imagine a population of 100,000 ape-like creatures 10 million years ago, more than the supposed time since the last common ancestor of humans and apes. Suppose a male and a female both received a mutation so beneficial that they survived while the 99,998 all died out. <laughs> then they had enough offspring to replenish the population of 100,000 in one generation. Ooh, okay. If this repeated every 20 years for 10 million in years, there would be 500,000 beneficial mutations added to the population. This amounts to only 0.02% of the human genome. Now, even the old myth of 1-2% to difference between human and chimp DNA wouldn't work. But we know the difference is actually at least 5%, or as much as 15%. Yeah. We did an entire episode on this subject titled Chimp to Human DNA, less similar than previously reported. Yeah, now obviously Haldane put forward an incredibly unlikely scenario here. Yeah. <laughs> he calculated a more realistic scenario would be one beneficial mutation about every 300 generations on average. For a total of 1,667 beneficial mutations over 10 million years. That's nothing. Definitely not enough. No. Even if the 1% difference were true, we'd need 30 million beneficial mutations, which would take about 9 billion generations or 180 <laughs> billion years. Yeah. That's about 13 times the supposed age of the universe, according to the Big Bang Theory. Now, evolutionists would need to stretch out the age of the universe in order to allow for human evolution, never mind everything else. Yeah, don't give them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, of course, God didn't need anywhere near that much amount of time. No. Back to Haldane's dilemma. Since only 2% of human DNA codes for proteins, it was assumed that the other 98% was non-functional and was eventually labeled junk DNA. Yeah. This appeared to solve the problem since there could be all kinds of neutral mutations in the junk DNA with no significant damage to the organism. Junk DNA was not just an arbitrary label, it was mathematically necessary for evolution to occur. Yeah, and this led to an unfortunate lack of research into the majority of the genome. Yeah. Junk DNA was assumed to be a result of evolution by mutation and was then used as proof of evolution. It's a bit of circular yeah. reasoning there. <laughs> like so. vestigial organs. Yes. About 100 years ago, there were around 100 body parts labeled vestigial. No one knew what these parts were for, so they were assumed by evolutionists to be leftovers or vestiges from a previous stage in human evolution. They were then used as evidence for evolution. This hindered research into these organs for many years. But guess what? Almost all of those vestigial organs have since been found to have a purpose, as if they were designed. Nice. Fearfully and <laughs> wonderfully made. I love it when science catches up with the Bible. Yeah. It's the same with junk DNA. Evolutionist assumptions hindered research. 
it, it, it took a while, but in 2003, finally, the ENCODE project, which stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, began uh, uh, studying just 1% of the human genome, including areas that did and did not code for protein. They found that 80% of so-called junk DNA has a function. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Lead analysis coordinator uh, Ewan Bernie said, it's likely that this 80% will go to 100%, said Bernie. We don't really have large chunks of redundant DNA. This metaphor of junk isn't that useful, he said. So Haldane's dilemma still hasn't been solved, nope. not even close. When we come back, we'll talk about how the human genome codes in four dimensions. Did you know that animals have genetic switches? These are regulatory regions of DNA that control the genes. Scientists have noticed that dramatic things can happen when a genetic switch is mutated. For instance, a mutated genetic switch can dramatically alter the appearance of stickleback fish or generate a great variety of coat colors in animals. Veterinary researcher Dr. Jean Leitner has suggested that God may have created genetic switches to facilitate variation, the switches having been created with a propensity to mutate without negatively affecting other traits. Modifications to genetic switches are not examples of evolution in action, even though they are often spoken of in that manner. Indeed, these changes don't involve new information, new genes arising, and evolutionists cannot explain the existence of the genetic switches in the first place. The more we learn about the complexity of genomes, the more they point to a super intelligent master programmer. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. I don't get how a geneticist or anyone who knows even a little bit about DNA can look at it and conclude random. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no design, nothing to see here. To get the information that we're sharing today out to more people, hit that like button and subscribe. It helps. Yeah, and sharing the video on Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere also helps more people see the silliness of evolution and the power of our Creator God. Stick around. There's even more amazing complexity at the smallest levels of life that we want to share, starting right now. Welcome back. We're going to continue discussing serious scientific problems with the evolutionary yeah. origin of life. Since DNA was discovered, researchers have been finding out more and more astounding things about it. And the more we learn, the less plausible evolution becomes. For example, human DNA codes in not just one, not two, not three, but four dimensions. Yeah, comparing the genetic code to a computer code, which we did, isn't really fair because it's way more complex than any computer code, and we'll show you how. A few years ago, researchers compared the relatively simple E. coli genome with the Linux operating system. The E. coli genome uses a few high-level instructions that control a few mid-level processes that in turn control a massive number of protein coding genes. Linux is much more top-heavy and thus much less efficient. E. coli can do a lot more with fewer controls. Now that's some great programming right there. Yeah, if we replace the four chemical letters with four colored pixels, it would look like this. That's just the first 700 letters of the human Y mm. chromosome. Lots of information stored in this long line of letters, mm -hmm. but that's just one dimension. Yeah, the second dimension deals with how one section of DNA interacts with another section. It would be impossible to draw arrows showing all the connections between different sections. This diagram shows a small portion of the microRNA regulatory network as it acts on just 13 genes associated with arteriosclerosis or the hardening of the arteries. Remember, this is just a tiny piece of a much bigger picture. One of the greatest mysteries about the human genome is that only about 22,000 genes can produce more than 300,000 distinct proteins. This means we don't have many more genes than simpler organisms, indicating efficiency in design. This is possible because genes get spliced and diced. It used to be thought that a single gene coded for a single protein, but it's not that simple. Protein genes are broken up into exons, which code for proteins and intervening non-coding sequences called introns. When the DNA gets copied, the gene is transcribed into RNA or ribonucleic acid. Then the introns get spliced out, the exons get stitched together, and the remainder is translated into a protein. Introns have specific sequences at the head and tail ends to tell the splicing mechanism where to cut. 
Exons also have splice signals at their ends. So the protein coding sections code for both protein sequence and splicing patterns at the same time. Yeah. The ENCODE project also documented an amazing amount of alternate splicing. And it appears there is some sort of splicing code. Yeah. But wait, a code means information, which would involve intelligence, wouldn't it? Yep, yep. Information comes only from intelligence. Yeah. Okay. Now, on the third dimension, amino acids come together in linear strings to form proteins. That sounds simple enough. Remember, the simpler it is, the easier it is to imagine it could come from evolution. It could be evolved. But genes that are used together do not necessarily appear near one another in the genome. There are sections of DNA that are buried deep within the coiled up DNA strand, meaning they cannot be easily activated. So 3D folding of chromosomes is incredibly important for overall gene function. That's right. <laughs> Every chemical letter needs to be in just the right place in line so it will make all the right connections after the DNA is folded. Yeah. Thus, when God wrote out the information in the genome along that one dimensional strand, he intentionally put things in a certain order so they would be in the correct place when the DNA was folded into a 3D shape. It's pretty hard to claim that DNA came from millions of years of random mutations that happened to occur in just the right spots in a tightly folded genome. Yeah, yeah. Imagine folding a sentence so that the letters line up with other letters in different parts of the sentence to make additional words giving you more than one sentence simultaneously. This is a huge problem for the concept of evolution by random mutation. Of course, this is not an issue if the genome was designed. We mentioned machinery a moment ago. Tiny machines translate the information in DNA, but how do we get those machines? <laughs> Philosopher of science, Sir Karl Popper noted, what makes the origin of life and of the genetic code a disturbing riddle is this. The genetic code is without any biological function unless it is translated. The machinery by which the cell translates the code consists of at least 50 macromolecular components, which are themselves coded in the DNA. Uh -oh. Thus, the code cannot be translated except by using certain products of its translation. This constitutes a baffling circle, a really vicious circle, it seems, for any attempt to form a model or theory of the genesis of the genetic code. In other words, you need the machines to translate the DNA in order to build the machines that translate the DNA yeah. so you can get the machines that translate. Yeah. It's a chicken and egg problem, yeah. right? And there are lots of those in molecular biology. But wait, there's more. The fourth dimension <laughs> deals with the way the first three dimensions change over time. That's right. The first three dimensions, the sequence of letters, the interaction network, and the shape of the chromosomes all change. Now, on the surface, that sounds like evolution, but it's actually okay. pre-programming. Certain genes get switched on and off at the right times in the right sequence. In other words, the genome regulates itself over time. Evolve that. <laughs> Now, we've only just briefly summarized the four-dimensional genome. For more on that, watch Dr. Robert Carter's talk, The High-Tech Cell. It's available on DVD or streaming at creation.com. More after this. One of the remarkable things about the geologic record is that blankets of sediments cover vast areas of the continents. In his book, The Nature of the Stratigraphical Record, evolutionary geologist Professor Derek Agar marveled at the way sedimentary layers extended for thousands of kilometres, even across continents. He was particularly impressed with the chalk beds that form the famous White Cliffs of Dover in southern England, as these trace all the way to Turkey and Egypt. The strata exposed in the walls of the Grand Canyon provide another example. Some of these sedimentary formations extend thousands of kilometres across North America. Such vast sedimentary layers suggest that geological processes must have occurred in the past that we don't observe today. Sedimentary deposits forming today are localised and confined to river deltas, lake beds and along narrow strips of coastline. Sedimentary blankets covering vast areas are exactly what we would expect if the global flood recorded in the Bible actually occurred. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, we've been talking about how the complexity of the human DNA supports creation. Yep. Now, a 10-year study called the Genotype Expression Project, or GTEx, was recently completed. The goal was to see how variations in the genome affect RNA production, phenotype, and disease. Uh, they were able to separate effects by sex, race, tissue type, and cell type. 
The hope was that sequencing the human genome would lead to a cure for disease. This failed massively. It was also thought that we would understand how the genome worked if we could only obtain the DNA sequence of our chromosomes. But as we've seen, there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> yeah. GTEx researchers obtained samples from 52 tissue types from 838 organ donors, making sure they had complete genomes for each donor. They also compared their results to those from living samples and cell culture. Here are some of their findings. Okay, variations in RNA expression and splicing are more common in coding areas, but only one third are affected by nearby variants. Mm. Long distance control of genes is quite common and a lot of variation exists in this system. Also, the average gene has more than one expressed mm. form. This makes sense in a creationist model right. as God programmed a huge amount of diversity into the genome from the beginning. Some tissues express genes differently than others, and there are both race-specific and sex-specific differences. Out of 13,294 genes associated with sex, sex differences across all tissues, only 369 of these had truly significant differences between the sexes. For example, SLC44A5 is a sugar and amino acid transport gene that is expressed in all tissue types. It's also one of the main drivers of different skin shades among the so-called races. Okay, yeah, over a third of all genes show sex-biased expression in at least one tissue. But individual variation produces overlapping effects. Mm. The difference between male and female is the result of the sum total of the effects of many different genes, many of which do not apply to obvious tissue differences between males and females. So it's a lot more complex than just X and Y chromosomes. God really did make male and female. That's right. Different cell types exist in any given tissue. They discovered 3,347 coding and non-coding genes with different expression profiles among the cell types with single tissues, and 987 genes with different splicing patterns. Okay, telomeres are repetitive DNA at the tips of most chromosomes mm -hmm. and are associated with longevity. Longer telomeres correlate to longer lifespans, which could help explain much of the longer lifespans before Noah. Yeah. Uh, think of it as a counting device with a number of beads on, on the end of the mm -hmm. chromosome, for example. Every time the cell divides, it's as if a bead is snipped off, shortening the telomere. Once all the beads are gone, cell division no longer takes place. It turns out that relative telomere length varies across tissues between the sexes. Rare variants occur throughout the human genome. Anytime you add new people to a genetic database, you will be adding new rare variants. This is due to the high rate of new mutations per generation. The rapid increase in human population size of the past few thousand years means that many of these rare mutations have not been lost. This makes sense in a creation model as the population has grown exponentially from only eight people approximately 4,400 years ago. Yeah, now this is just a summary of some of the findings of the GTEx study. Again, we see how evolutionary assumptions led to false conclusions, or, or in this case, false predictions. Several years and billions of dollars later, researchers are still just getting a glimpse into the amazingly complex functional machine that God created out of dust. Which he made from nothing. From nothing, right. yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the benefits of learning some of these amazing discoveries that we've summarized today is it fills you with an awe for God. Uh, Psalm 104, 24 says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all, for the earth is full of your creatures. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Wow, we covered quite a bit today. But, yes, uh, we certainly did. Anyways, we'll <laughs> see you next week. And remember, Christianity is an evidence-based faith. And science supports scripture. Wait, 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 don't go just yet. If you learn something, then others will too. Share this video as widely as you can. And if you haven't yet, hit that like button. Yeah, or leave a comment about what you found most interesting or respond to some of the other comments. Those activities help push the video to other people's feeds. Thanks for watching.